Hello, everybody. I'm Felix Wemheuer, Professor for Modern China Studies at the University of Cologne, and this is my YouTube channel, Studying Mouse China. But today we want to talk about a more uh, recent uh, issue, and I like to welcome uh, Susanne Weiglin Schwerzig. Welcome, Susanne. Hi, Felix. So Susanne have been interviewed here several times and he, she is Professor Emeritus at the University of Vienna and also now Program Director at the Center for Strategic Analysis in Vienna. And we want to talk about China's role in the Ukrainian war. The Russian military attack on Ukraine in February of 2022 placed the Chinese government in a very difficult situation because the PSC had close economic and diplomatic relation to both countries. Putin's Russia is seen as a strategic ally to counter US pressure. However, China was the most important trading partner of Ukraine and the Ukrainian government was willing to supply important military nuclear and space technology to the PRC. However, uh, moreover, Russia and Ukraine are both parts, as we know, of the one belt, one road strategy. So our first topic will be the position of the Chinese government. So since late February, spokesmen of the Chinese government repeatedly called Russia and Ukraine to end fighting and start negotiations. They emphasized the security needs national security and integrity of both sides should be respected. Uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi also repeated this in his speech in the General Assembly of the United Nations. However, most Western media portray China as a close ally of Russia in the war. The Chinese offer to support negotiation was ignored by Western countries, but also by Russia. I think only the Ukrainian government reacted positively to it. What are the reasons for this? Very interesting question. Thank you very much, Felix. I think uh, basically we can uh, uh, find two main reasons why China has not been heard and not been asked to intervene into the situation uh, between Russia and uh, Ukraine. And uh, the first reason seems to be that um, Ukraine, Russia, and the US are not interested in ending the war. Um, this is, has been true for most of the time uh, since the beginning of the war. It um, has changed in between a little bit because uh, we do remember that at uh, the beginning of uh, the war, uh, in a certain period of time, Ukraine was willing and was actually negotiating with Russia on a um, at least um, uh, a, a hold of um, military uh, fighting. Um, however, uh, after a certain period of time, and especially when uh, the pictures and images from Bucha came out, uh, Ukraine changed its point of view. And at about the same time, the US also announced that they think that uh, Ukraine needs to fight against Russia for a longer period of time in order to make Russia so weak that it will not be able in future for a long period to come to go for war against any of the other neighboring countries. And uh, under these conditions, of course, um, nobody was really interested in any peace negotiations. And so China's um, uh, idea about mm. bringing this war mm. to an immediate end mm. was not heard. Um, however, there are also very, very um, concrete reasons. We know that China is not the only country asking for an immediate end of the mm. fighting. And there were several other countries, including Israel and, and Turkey, uh, which actually uh, sort of came up with the idea of acting as a moderator in this difficult conflict. Uh, but China was constantly left out, and um, especially from the U.S. side, but also um, most broadcasting stations and newspapers in, in Europe actually reiterated the idea that China was not neutral in this conflict, but was actually a strong ally of Russia. And some people even thought that China was somehow helping Russia to continue with its war. And I think the reason why this uh, narrative um, has been so virulent uh, in Europe and in the US is the fact that 
uh, one thing the US actually does not want to happen is to have China involved in this whole affair, um, especially if China acted as a moderator, uh, the US would be confronted with a moderator not willing to leak information about the um, negotiations to the US side. And that's why the US would always, you know, if a moderator is needed and if a country uh, was picked as the moderator, then it should be from the US point of view, a country uh, with friendly, friendly relations to the US so that the US could make sure that the information pipeline would always be open. Yeah, we will talk about the US role in more detail later. Let's uh, talk about uh, the Chinese uh, discourse. Uh, you said that China is officially neutral. It's very interesting to see that the topic is highly controversial among public intellectuals in China, uh, which position they should take in this war. For example, some nationalists such as uh, Zhang Weiwei, who is a professor at Fudan University and a TV commentator, believes that Russia is fighting a war to liberate the Eurasian country, continent from US dominion. Ever liberal public intellectuals emphasize Russia's imperialist motives. They are worried that the establishment of two economic camps, one US-led and one Sino-Russian camp, could have a very destructive impact on the Chinese economy. A former Chinese ambas ambassador to Ukraine argued that Russia's poor military performance in Ukraine would have proven the backwardness of the country and a big technology gap compared to leading NATO states. His statement implied that China should not count on an isolated and backward loser. In the Chinese official media, especially television, experts are often analyzing the latest statements of the Russian and Ukrainian government and developments on the battlefield in very detail, without even mentioning the role of the Chinese government. Many of this uh, can be uh, watched at uh, YouTube. On official websites, for example, CCTV or China Daily, the Ukrainian war or conflict, how they call it is not a strong focus. How do we explain the open split among the Chinese public intellectuals and the almost careful reporting in the official media? From my point of view, the main reason for this situation is the fact that um, the Chinese leadership actually is divided on this issue. And I think we can observe in many fields where the Chinese leadership is not um, united that then intellectuals actually have the space to uh, openly discuss the question. And I think it is quite interesting to see how many different opinions actually are being debated in China in comparison to what we see in our public sphere, both in, uh, especially in Europe, but to a certain degree also in, in, in the US. And um, I think that basically we can um, uh, see that there are two camps within the uh, Chinese leadership. And these two camps uh, divide into a pro-Russian attitude and uh, um, sort of an, an attitude which is critical of what Russia has been doing since um, February and uh, which more tends towards aligning with the sort of Western um, uh, public opinion about this issue. And to a certain degree, we can even say that the um, sort of public intellectuals voicing what you just called the more liberal stance towards this um, whole issue, uh, they actually reiterate the Western narrative, whereas the pro-Russian um, intellectuals tend to reiterate the Russian narrative. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are also uh, sort of people who, who, who um, articulate the sort of compromise that was found um, inside the Chinese leadership, which is the so-called neutrality. Mm -hmm. I would say it's maybe not a neutrality, it's more a middle point of view, a third point of view, um, because it is characterized by both understanding some of the concerns of the Russian side, mm -hmm. as well as understanding some of the concerns on the Ukrainian side. And as you rightly said, uh, one of the reasons why this is so is of course because um, uh, China sees that it wants to continue its close cooperation with uh, the Ukraine, 
Um, this cooperation has been extremely fruitful from a Chinese point of view. And Ukraine is the partner in the Belt and Road Initiative in the eastern part of Europe. So there are many reasons why China does not want to lose a good friend uh, among the Ukrainians. And on the other hand, as you said, of course, China is closely linked uh, to, to Russia. Um, uh, I think the intellectuals in China uh, mostly sort of seem to be debating this, but while they're debating the Ukraine issue, they're actually debating the position or the future position of China in the world. And I think it is also quite interesting to see that uh, none of these intellectual actually, uh, intellectuals actually question uh, the claim that China should play a leading role in the system of international relations. Uh, they all think that China has now developed to a point that it should be regarded by other nations as one of the leading nations of the world. And uh, the divide is actually about how do we um, sort of achieve this kind of recognition within the shortest period of time. And uh, this is the reason why they actually can debate and why they do debate on these issues. And uh, at this moment, uh, I would say that uh, the pro-Russian people um, sort of um, go with the uh, sort of um, nationalists in, uh, no. in Russia. Uh, but they're also, I think, really interested in sort of uh, using this opportunity um, to really uh, sort of enforce a um, restructuring of the world order onto the world. And um, uh, I think one of the reasons why they are so articulate is that they think that uh, now the situation has come for the world to be rearranged. And in this situation, China will be more easily uh, in a situation and in a position where it can solve its Taiwan problem. Yeah. So it's also related to the sort of um, yeah. interest of China that China has itself in uh, sort of um, um, reuniting the country. And uh, I think that this is also something we should have in mind that despite the fact that these intellectuals have very divergent ideas, they also have similar ideas and the similar similarity of ideas is to be found in their common understanding of China as a leading power in the international system of uh, in the system of international relations and the second common idea they have is that somehow the Taiwan issue has to be solved um, as soon as possible yeah but maybe the poor Russian military uh, performance and defeats on a battlefield will weaken the enthusiasm for the Sino-Russian alliance, uh, we, will, we will see. Yes, yeah. I think you are totally right, yeah. because we can see that when, uh, when the Russian yeah. military yeah. performed very badly yeah. at the beginning of the war, uh, there were many voices, yeah. also publicized voices, that um, um, uh, analyzed the situation yeah. of Russia. Yeah. And um, in this situation, it was difficult for the pro-Russian yeah. people to actually voice their opinions. And now that Russia is in difficulty again, uh, we see that yeah. the situation is a little bit similar yeah. to the beginning of the war. And uh, I think to a certain degree, we can very well understand that the Chinese leadership as well as leading Chinese intellectuals don't want to take the risk of siding with this side that is going yeah. to be defeated in this war. Yeah, the Chinese media are also very interested in the military and technological aspects of the war because they also have many, many Russian equipments, right, in the People's Liberation Army. Yeah. yeah yes, we also asked uh, why, uh, why, you know, like, for example, on TV, they are uh, doing this meticulous analysis uh, of the situation. Every day you uh, can listen to Jinri uh, Yato, um, for example, um, uh, and, and you will be given sort of an update of everything and they will have footage from, mm. uh, from Russia, from mm. Ukraine, mm. From, from the US, and they're trying to sort of look at all different mm. perspectives. I think this is very interesting. And uh, the main reason why they do this is I think to sort of uh, to rationalize the situation and to make public opinion less emotional mm. about the situation because we know from 
uh, the conversations on social media mm -hmm. that some people react very emotionally. And uh, I think for the Chinese leadership to mm -hmm. be able and to be free to take the kind of decisions they want to take, they need to cool things down a little bit. And I think that yeah. this daily analysis actually is yeah. Uh, sort of supposed to help in this. Yeah. yeah, I think it's also obvious that in this official discourse, they're supporting uh, parts of the Russian narrative that, for example, uh, NATO expansion uh, contributed to the escalation of the conflict. Uh, but I, I never heard that they were demonizing the Ukrainian government or called it a, a fascist. So the whole kind of anti-fascist framing of the war by by Putin, it's not repeated in 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 the Chinese in the yeah, Chinese exactly, media. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the role of the U.S. So instead of offering something to the Chinese government to distance itself from Russia, it seems that the Biden administration is waiting for an event that would justify to extend economic sanctions to China, for example, for an attack on on Taiwan. One official goal of the U.S. government is to reorder global production chains of important strategic goods while excluding Chinese producers. The U.S. government and their close allies, allies want to struggle against Russia and China at the same time. This is surprising because a major belief of U.S. geopolitical thinking was always to prevent a strong anti-American alliance on the Eurasian continent. For example, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger played the Chinese card against the Soviet Union in the 1970s. By contrast, the political scientist John Mersheimer argues since a decade that the US should improve their relations with Putin in order to contain the real challenge, China. So Mersheimer is often interviewed in, in China because he is criticizing the US uh, NATO expansion. But I think this second part of his argument is uh, not so popular and uh, never mentioned. Why does the US government always force an appearance uh, of a Sino-Russian camp mm -hmm. instead of doing everything to prevent it? First of all, I think uh, the experience of the US in fighting wars at two fronts mm -hmm. is different from the, uh, um, from the fear of the uh, Russian government or the former uh, Soviet Union government to have to fight a mm -hmm. two-front war. Uh, because during World War II, um, uh, the U.S. was actually fighting at two different fronts. It was uh, fighting against Japan and was fighting against Germany. And it was victorious in this fight. And so I think that there is not sort of this very basic fear that Russians might have uh, to have to fight at two fronts. And I think this is something we have to keep at the back of our mind. However, as I just said, um, the strategy of the U.S. Um, for the situation between Russia and U Ukraine is using the war in Ukraine to um, make Russia as um, feeble as possible uh, uh, and to prevent, uh, so as to prevent uh, Russia uh, in the future to, to take any military actions against countries in their neighborhood. So um, why do they still think that uh, China is more dangerous than Russia? they think that they can sort of solve the two problems at the same time. And um, uh, if we look at it from the other side of the picture, they want more um, liberty and freedom for Taiwan. And they might even go so far as to provoke China by sort of um, pretending to be, uh, to be uh, acknowledging the independence of Taiwan but they don't want a military um, fight between China and the US at this moment. So if we look into history and if we see that in, during the 1950s when China tried to what they call liberate Taiwan twice, in both cases, they asked the Soviet Union for support and they wanted the Soviet Union support to run why they were running the risk of a military confrontation with the US. So from our historical experience and from our reservoir of historical experience, we would anticipate that China 
uh, will more easily take the risk of going against Taiwan militarily if it knew that the so uh, that Russia could actually mm. support it. And as long as Russia is fighting in Ukraine, mm. Russia cannot support mm. uh, China. And for that reason, uh, I think it is um, it is a good idea to sort of uh, look at China as a close ally and uh, to actually sort of uh, not, not China into getting closer and closer to Russia, because under these conditions, um, on the one hand side, uh, um, China might want Russia to support its military attack against Taiwan, but Russia will not be able to do so. And uh, on the other hand, uh, if uh, Russia uh, goes on um, fighting in the Ukraine and China uh, will take the risk of attacking Taiwan, I think the uh, US uh, feels strong enough uh, to actually counter both um, problems at the same time. And for that reason, uh, Joe Biden has actually um, sort of formed alliances both um, in the EU part of uh, Europe, as well as in the Pacific. And uh, I think um, their strategy, while it might sound very logical, <laughs> Uh, at the same time, it's extremely risky because uh, with the U.S. being directly or indirectly part of the conflict, both in Europe and in uh, East Asia, uh, we have the problem that if both conflicts are being risen to the um, military level, then this uh, implies that they are not regional conflicts anymore and that we are at the verge of a world war. And I think this is the biggest risk the, uh, the US is taking in this situation. And um, I think this is something we as Europeans have to keep in mind why we design our attitude towards both of these conflicts. Yeah, and maybe it's also an illusion that uh, Russia is willing to support uh, China uh, in a military attack on Taiwan because uh, Russia have, for example, Vietnam and India as close allies. So I think in the Pacific regions, maybe China cannot expect a lot of support from, from Russia anyway. Well, I'm not sure about this because recently I think uh, Putin has been quite outspoken. Mm in um, supporting mm. uh, China's claim mm. for Taiwan. Uh, of course, he has not uh, said anything about the military side. And I would also uh, claim that at this particular moment, um, China is not waiting for a military conflict mm. over Taiwan. Mm. Um, there are still uh, forces in China that hope that uh, you can sort of uh, convince Taiwan mm into a non-military uh, solution of the question, um, or you can take a military action that will not necessarily provoke a major uh, military conflict in the region. Mm. Uh, but I would also say after reading uh, the white book on Taiwan that came out recently, that China has defined a red line and we should be sure that we uh, actually um, know about this. And the red line is, of course, um, the declaration of independence on the side of the um, Taiwanese um, uh, government and the recognition of Taiwan's independence by the US and other allies. And I think this is the red line. And this is also the moment when all the different opinions about what to do about Taiwan and what to do about Ukraine and things like this will then suddenly be united and everybody will um, support the idea that um, China must take military action against yeah. uh, what is happening in Taiwan. Yeah, uh, Germany is actually also a country that has a trauma regarding fighting on two fronts. Yeah, but uh, Russia was our most important energy supplier and China is the most important trading partner, but still our foreign minister believes that we could decouple uh, mm -hmm. from both. So. We hope that will not lead to a collapse of the German economy in, in the next months. Yes, it's uh, very interesting to see that, uh, you know, Xi Jinping actually um, has shifted the focus of Chinese mm -hmm. policy from economics to politics again. And so uh, politics is in command in China. And we, can, we have been watching this for a couple of years. 
And I think none of us would have expected that something similar could happen mm -hmm. in Europe. But at this moment, we see that in Europe, politics is in command mm -hmm. and you can do everything mm -hmm. to ruin your economy mm -hmm. um, because of mm -hmm. political reasons. And I think this is what is actually happening in many countries in Europe and especially in Germany, as Germany always has to show that it is the best friend of the US. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's talk about the possibility of uh, negotiation in uh, Ukraine. So since uh, several months, major Western leaders argue that peace negotiations with Russia would not be possible and only Ukrainian victories on the battlefield could stop Putin. President Zelensky, who was willing to negotiate about armed neutrality of Ukraine in March, 2022 is now calling to liberate Crimea from the last Russian soldier. According to my view, the Biden administration is using the Ukrainian forces to weaken Russia in a long war of attrition. I think you said something similar. This does not mean that the Ukrainian government has no own agenda. However, the goals of the Ukrainians to defend their country is overlapping with long-term US geopolitical goals in Europe. It is very obvious that the Western sanctions so far did not work to ruin Russia as planned. On the contrary, millions of people in Europe feel poverty and several sectors of the economy are afraid of bankruptcy due to exploding energy costs and inflation. However, most of the European governments are still following the US strategy and they are betting on a short and mild winter this year. The German and French government uh, gave up their role as of mediators between Russia and Ukraine. Do you see any actors who could bring diplomacy back in? What role could China play? Well, you're totally right in describing the situation as very difficult. And um, I think we, we lost the, the best chance to end the war as soon as possible during the first few days of the war. And it is quite interesting when we look into history We see, for example, for example the, uh, the Chinese um, invading uh, Vietnam back in 1979. And when they saw that they couldn't fulfill their aims, uh, they immediately retreated. Uh, and it is very, very important that this actually happens at the very beginning of military fighting, because once the dynamic of military fighting has actually um, Uh, come to a certain level, then it's very, very difficult. And we come into the next stage, which is that both sides don't want to uh, talk about peace. And we have been watching this for a certain period of time. So um, I think that China is waiting for, its, um, for the right moment to interfere. And um, I think this right moment, uh, if we look at history again, um, can be a moment, for example, that we are watching at this moment happening, which is that the side which most people think could be the winning side is actually in such a difficult situation that they want to end the war in order to uh, be totally defeated. Um, a very good example of uh, this is actually um, the Vietnam War, when suddenly um, Uh, um, uh, the U.S. Uh, was willing to retreat and uh, a little bit similar is, of course, the situation, a uh, very recent situation in Afghanistan. Then the second possibility, of course, is that if the war of attrition goes on for a certain period of time, then both sides will see that they cannot really win the war. Mm. And then they tend to come to uh, a solution that is negotiated rather than uh, fought for militarily. And a very good example of this is, of course, the Korean War. And if we look at the Korean War, we can see that they missed a chance to come to an earlier end of this war and then went through one and a half years of a war of attrition in which most of the civilians and most of the uh, soldiers who died during that war actually died. So it's a terrible situation, but unfortunately, we see this happening um, again and again in history. And maybe the last uh, situation would be, and I think with what, some of what you just said, you hinted at this uh, situation. It is a situation when we encounter um, major uh, social destabilization because of the economic side effects of the sanctions and of the, the war as such. 
And uh, I think that this is a situation where a third party suddenly will um, voice its hope for a negotiated peace. And this third party, of course, could be um, Europe. However, as Europe is aligning so strongly with the US and the US is perceived as a hidden actor in this whole conflict, uh, Europe will not be able to act as a moderator. And uh, in this situation to find a moderator will not be so easy uh, because uh, you need a country that really has good relations to both sides and you need a country that is comparatively strong. So for example, Turkey is uh, a country that has good relations to both sides, but it's not really strong enough. So there is quite a possibility for the world asking China to uh, actually get active in this process. And I think we have seen in the past that uh, China um, has very, very good diplomats and um, I'm sure they won't send their wolf diplomats into this kind of uh, negotiations. So um, there is a possibility for China to act as a moderator. And I think that China is waiting for a good moment to enter because China only wants to openly articulate that it wants to act as a moderator if it counts on a success mm -hmm. in this moderation process. So it will never uh, uh, sort of talk about moderation and things like this if the side, if the if time is not right for this. And so that is why they're still sort of acting behind the curtain. They don't make their stand very clear. Um, but I think they're also giving signals and uh, to a certain degree under, you know, for a certain period of time, the US was in very intensive talks with China uh, because the US knows that, you know, if things go really, really bad, then the world might eventually need China. Yeah. So we are in a very difficult situation now in, in Europe and also in the world. So uh, thanks a lot for this interview. And uh, yeah, have a nice day. Goodbye. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Bye-bye.